And just like that, I am live with Dr. Sasha McKenzie. It's always a pleasure to have you on, Sasha. So th thanks for uh, coming on again. It's a pleasure to have a chat with you. Yeah, I was, glad to I be was on. very thrilled and, and happy when I texted you a couple of weeks ago with a question on uh, toe droop and, and shaft spine aligning um, that you said, hey, why don't I just come on the show and talk again? So I didn't know if that was because the first couple of times I actually did a good job because the first time you came, I don't know if I had a clue what I was doing. The second time we talked about the stack and we had a great time, but I'm like, it's either that or he's kind of wants to get ahead of Andrew and, and Fawcett and Calx that they've been on twice. He's been on <laughs> twice. And he wants to get on three times. So, but it's always great to have you on. So thank you. My pleasure. My so pleasure. happy um, to talk golf. The, the, you, you've done a, a fair amount of research on shafts and anybody that goes to your website, and obviously we have that always in the summary, a quick link, but you've done, as far as I can tell, about four papers. It, it's been a little bit of time since you've done those, but you're always, you're like the mad scientist in your lab. I'm sure you're always playing around with something. Um, but the, the question I reached out to you on just to kind of jump right into that was uh, spining of shafts because I had gotten into a discussion with somebody on a YouTube post that my opinion was it is i had said it's a weak point which before the weld seam goes in it is but then it becomes a strong point of the shaft as that beta weld goes on and we're talking about steel shafts um but my point of contention was if you put the the seam at 12 o'clock or six o'clock you're going to improve the toe droop deflection but you're going to lose on the deflection of the shaft face control and if you put it at three and nine o'clock, you're going to gain on deflection, but you lose on toe droop. So you're going to lose something was the whole point of the video that I did. And that the other portion of that was it's really not worth it because you can't measure how minute the benefits are going to be unless you get a very terrible shaft that you're starting with. So that that, that was the genesis of my text to you. And, and that led us to where we are right now. So can you just sure. kind of give some of your input on that? Sure. Uh, well, you know, uh, uh, unfortunately... I spend, or maybe fortunately, I spend a lot of time doing research, generating results. Um, and then before I get to, it takes a bit of work to submit to a scientific journal. Um, usually uh, researchers have a, you know, a throng of students that will, will do a lot of the grunt work, but um, uh, I, I do all the writing myself. And so a lot of times I'm on to the next project. I know the result. Great. Maybe I'll present it at a conference, mm -hmm. you know, a, a coaching education thing or in a podcast like this. And because I know the answer, I don't bother submitting it to a journal, which is too bad because this, uh, the study I did uh, with um, uh, Eric Hendrickson at Ping on, on shaft spining or flowing was a pretty good one. It was some very good research. So maybe um, I'll eventually get this submitted. Um, so th there's a lot kind of to unpack. Um, uh, maybe... Uh, the, the, maybe I'll talk about the study first. You can ask some questions and then sure. we'll get into the, we'll get that out of the way. So, um, the, the, the general idea, uh, just to provide a bit of motivation for why I did the research is that if you, uh, orient the stiffest or weakest bending plane of the shaft in a certain orientation relative to the face that you will see improved performance. Um, the, the, probably the most, um, prolific, um, method out there is called peering. And there's a company mm -hmm. that, uh, that does that and you put a little device and away you go. Now, what's, what I find very interesting is that, um, if you chat with representatives or talk with folks that do it, they say, you know, it's, it's, it's proprietary. There's this, you know, secret sauce in there, but the, <laughs> the irony is that they've also got a a bunch of patents. So the whole point of a patent is that there isn't a secret sauce. So you can't have it both ways. I can go and read the patents mm -hmm. and I can, and the, the whole point of a patent is so that someone else can't come along and, and duplicate it and, and start using their method. So you have to be very explicit in, in what you're doing. That's the point of the patent. And I can read, and I'm used to reading golf research so I can understand what they accomplished in the patent. Um, you know, or, or you can do it like, coke um and not have a patent and just have a secret side and no one can say oh this is exactly what coke said anyway so i find that that interesting so um understanding to the best of my ability that i can read to try and understand what what, what they're uh aligning the, you know the most prominent method out there you know what which orientation of the properties of the shaft are they aligning to the face or in the in the droop direction um i wanted to duplicate that and, and run a test. 
and Ping was kind enough to work with some of their uh, shaft suppliers to supply, to find two shafts, um, one that had very different, that was, had a very big spine. So there was a 10 CPM difference between the stiffest bending plane and the weakest bending plane. Mm -hmm. Now, th this, uh, this shaft, this shaft would never, um, sorry, I'm getting... I'm connected to my phone. We'll have to edit this out, Pete. I'm connected okay, to my no phone. Problem. I'm getting uh, getting uh, phone calls. Let me shut this off. Um, there we go. Do not. Stop. Sorry about that. You're good. Um. So. Uh, the 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 shafts that were created. There was two of them. One you would never use. Um, it had a 10 centimeter per cycle, 10 CPM difference between the stiffest bending plane and the most flexible bending plane. The other one was a very high quality shaft. And I ran uh, essentially two different studies that were the same. Um, Ping also created a version of their eight lobe adapter so that you could rotate it around uh, in 45 degree increments, but it wouldn't change the lie or the loft or facing essentially all it was doing was changing the orientation of the mm -hmm. shaft in the head and this was important because uh previous research was a study that was done with um iron shafts uh, by rancourt and they used three separate clubs and as you know you can try your best to make three clubs identical but trying to get you know right. a club perfectly the same in a lie loft machine or every, it, it, it's challenging um, so I wanted to use the exact same shaft and just be able to rotate it by, you know, taking the head off, turning that, that lobe adapter. And so um, Eric at, at Ping ran a bunch of tests in the shafts to find the flat line oscillation bending plane. If, if you're if you're familiar with that, basically you can stick a, um, if you've seen this on YouTube, you stick a laser that points directly at the shaft. You twang the shaft and you, you, you find the direction where the laser just traces out perfectly up and down a straight line. That is the, the flow orientation, if you want and, to call it. And it doesn't oscillate. It doesn't move in a circle. Right, right. And then any other orientation will kind of the thing after a few cycles, it will start to, to oval. Mm -hmm. And that's a printout you get if from the, the puring. You know, it's like, hey, look, this is, this is really good. This is the way we've found. And then the, this other orientation is terrible. So we did that. And um, then I ran a study where um, we had uh, 40 golfers and they would hit uh, six drives with it aligned according to the way that should produce the best results, right? Six drives with it at 90 degrees to that and six drives with it at a 45 degree angle to either of those two. So we're testing, systematically testing three orientations of this really bad shaft on day one. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it's important to, you know, to control for everything, to try and have the study balance. So golfers warm up, we, we make sure ball speed stabilized, they're hitting good shots. Golfer one would do a certain order of conditions. So uh, the flow lined up lead lag for six, then the flow lined up uh, toe up, toe down for six, then at the 45. And then they would repeat again. Do, do, do. Golfer two would use a different order. They would do the 45 degree first, then six, then six. So there, there's, there's this balanced uh, approach with the study. It's not like every golfer is doing all 12 drives with one orientation. Mm -hmm. um, and we do that through the study. Does that make sense? So it's, it's yeah, balanced. Completely. And we're giving very uh, explicit instructions. You can't, you can't tell. You're just turning the shaft. So they don't know. Um, what orientation or, or what to expect. We just say, hey, in fact, we'd go to the other side of the hitting bay away from them and, and they wouldn't know if we're giving them a different driver, if they're, maybe we're not even changing it. And I've done that before, I've done a study, just shoes and I've given them the same driver. And, you know, so anyway. Um, uh, so have those 40 participants, uh, they're given very explicit instructions. So we're trying to hit a, uh, a drive on a, on a par four. They can picture it on the simulator screen. We're trying to have the ball land as close to the center of the fairway as we can. We're going for a balance of distance and accuracy. And we would then compute stroke gain driving for those 36 uh, drives, 12 with each shaft. 
same study, same thing I just described on a separate day, bring the same golfers back in, but now they're going to use the shaft that has essentially uh, no spine. You know, it was think there was two CPM difference mm-hmm. between the, the stiffest bending much plane and the quality. weakest bending. Much, the, 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 yeah, the much exactly. And that's way better. Exactly. And that, that one that, that, that had a, you know, a large spine, if you will, that would never make it, probably wouldn't even make it, you know, maybe Walmart. You might find that shot, maybe, but that's pretty bad. And I should mention that um, there's lots of reasons why you can get this with shafts. So it, it could be um, a little bit more material. It could mm-hmm. be that they just aren't perfectly round, um, and none of them are. You know, there's you know, there's always some something that's a little bit off. Um, yes, especially if, it, it, and I'm assuming that these were graphite shafts. Yes, uh, and at the time, yeah. more like a table rolled, where where they're ro- basically rolled up like a cigar. Yeah, and then, then yeah. put, put in a kiln and, and then heat dried. Okay. Yeah. So just want to make that distinction for anyone out there who might be garage mechanic uh, with their golf set, and they're gonna say, "Oh, they didn't talk about this." So just want to identify that, so no one can say, "What well, did you talk do this?" So you you checked all the boxes. Right. So we have one group that's making the shafts, um, ping that's testing the shafts to you know find the the flow line and also, you know, their full battery of shaft testing. So it's not just a flow line, but the EI curves up and down and it, you know, they're, they're mm-hmm. all the properties of the shafts. And then they're coming to me and I'm running the, uh, the experiment. So to me, the, the, the most important number is strokes gained off the tee with each club. And there's no statistical differences. So it's basically fuzz, which I'll explain why I would anticipate that, but just because you have a theory about why this isn't going to work, you still run the experiment. Um, if anything, there is a slight edge towards the orientation that should be the least effective. <laughs> okay. Um, it, it, opposite to, but I mean, again, it didn't quite reach significance, but it's like, yeah, this one had slightly better strokes gain. Um, now, then, and then the same thing on the second day. So, you know, bring people in a second day, they hit all, all these shots, and it's just no, noise. And if you go, hey, which shaft did you prefer? Shaft one, two, or three, it's equal preference, you know, after they hit these shots. Oh, I like shaft one. Oh, I like shaft two. And so like, there's, there's no rhyme or reason to which shaft you know, orient which driver they liked, uh, any of the orientations, and five had no preference. Um, so it doesn't seem to be anything there as far as I can see. Now, if we get into the theory, um, there are two main reasons uh, why I wouldn't expect this to have any um, increase in variability and performance. There might be a systematic difference, which Rancourt found. So if you align the stiffest section, stiffest bending plane of the shaft in lead lag, that means that you are going to get a little bit less lead deflection with the driver at impact, Mm -hmm. which means you'll probably get a little bit less vertical launch and a little bit less spin. But most shafts, the difference is like, two CPMs, maybe three, if it's right on the edge of, you know, not meeting quality control, that is going to be really tough to pull out. Rancourt did show, they found that, that actually, yeah, depending on the orientation, we'll see a slight increase um, in, in loft if you put the weakest bending plane in the lead lag direction, which, which, which kind of makes sense. But then, you know, th- that's, that's not something that makes the shaft better or worse. It just changes the systematic effect. It's just like, mm-hmm. okay, we tried this. It looks like you're hitting it a little bit too high. Well, let's try a little stiffer shaft, you know, and, and, it, and it's a, it's a small effect. Um, the, the big, the big issue with that, that I think I have with why I wouldn't expect this to work is that when you flow a shaft, you know, with that laser, you have to very specifically orient the direction that you're loading the shaft with the force that you're applying, right? So if I'm applying a vertical force or a horizontal force and that spine needs to be oriented at a perfect angle to that load. In a golf swing, we apply no such load. (laughs) We apply 
forces in all directions across the shaft at different times throughout the swing. So, and that's the theory. If you say we're aligning the shaft, what are you aligning it to? Well, you were aligning it to the forces that the golfer is putting in, but those forces can't be aligned with, you know, they're, Mm -hmm. they're all over the place. And then even if we did apply golfer to golfer, the same pattern of forces, if that was somehow possible, me and you, we had the exact same force application. It, it doesn't take much of a stretch to look at the club face orientation of Dustin Johnson at the top and the club face orientation of someone like Webb Simpson and Mm -hmm. say, well, even if they're applying the same forces, they've oriented that shaft in completely different positions. So there's no way, there's really no way you can align that weakest bending plane or the stiffest bending plane to anything that matters. There's, there's nothing about, you know, aligning it to the face or aligning it to the droop. There's nothing dynamic about those things. What matters is the, the forces that are being applied. And that is demonstrated in the, the test. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, we need to line this shaft up with the direction of applying a force. Golfers don't do that. The other main issue is, is that when you do that flatline oscillation test, it takes a few oscillations to actually start to see the ovaling. The golf swing does not go through a few oscillations. <laughs> the shaft, you know, goes into lagging, then leading, toe up, then toe down. So there's there's not this oscillation where you would get to see, you know, some kind of random variation come out in the shaft. And then we the the, the third point is that the amount of damping in the hands of a golfer is very different than the machine that you'd be using to measure the flatline yeah. oscillation. So for for me, bottom line is theory makes no sense. Okay, fine. Maybe I'm missing something. Let's run the experiment. Let's use two uh, really the spine with a uh, shaft with a really big spine, a shaft with virtually no spine, no performance differences with forty golfers. Yeah. Well, that, that I, I'm glad you said that because you you had forty and I had access to forty thousand fittings that the database. I'm looking at this and and. And, and anyone I've talked to that really knows physics, you being one, the fellow I mentioned that I used to work for being another, um, has always said, <laughs> we, we know what the answer is based off physics. Now, is there maybe something that that um, within all the variables of how the shaft is constructed and materials and things like that that might change it? Maybe. So let's run a test to see if anything has been updated that, that might influence one way or another. And But there hasn't been anything to come along yet in, in today's technological era. Outside of making a shaft, like the only thing I can think of is the difference between table roll graphite and a filament wound where the filament, the winding is the the shaft in the manufacturing is stretched like taffy and it's not wound up. So you you don't really have a seam in a filament wound where you might have one in a a roll. But again, it's so minuscule and there is no difference. Uh, And there's so many other variables that play a greater role in that, you know, and you just hit. You know, I mean, and the list is arguably endless. You, know, you got the, the force coupling of the hands and where you apply the force and it's not in a straight line. I mean, it just goes on and on. So I'm glad we got that out there. That was, <laughs> and that, yeah. that comes from the, the, the sharpest mind and the, the lead researcher in the industry right now. So if you didn't want to believe me in my post, at least yeah. listen, listen to, uh, to Sasha. Um, on some of your, your other papers, uh, you, uh, you, you did some work on CPM. I think that was with Eric as well. Is yep, is that work? And, and that that was almost. It's hard to believe that was a decade ago, or pushing a decade. H- have have you guys discussed that paper at all, and uh, and doing an update on that, or did, have you found out at least um, without needing to do another test that the um, conclusions that you guys drew up back then still hold true to today? Yeah, they they still hold true. Um, Ping is uh, can can crank out a lot more research than I can. Um, uh, you know, I might mm, arguably noodle it a bit more than, than they would, you know, or have, have, uh, you know, a a different purpose for my, my research, but they're really good and they do a ton of stuff and they're Mm -hmm. constantly repeating things with slightly, you know, 
different shafts, different club heads. You know, they, they've uh, they've got a ton of data. Nothing, nothing's really changed. They just recently uh, did. They have a new uh, facility at Loughborough, and they looked at um, a very similar study that I did uh, with the shaft, influence of shaft stiffness on uh, on performance. Um, yeah, and there's 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 not much new. Um, the you know what what amazes me, or it's still you know kind of the most interesting thing that comes out of that research is that. The more flexible the shaft, the more likely you will have, uh, or you will have increased bend lofted impact. So I quantify every shaft with a driver is in lead deflection at impact. Mm -hmm. The more lead deflection you have, the more it increases the loft of the club head. Um, so that that is like 99.9% .9 true. If I give Pete a more flexible shaft than the one he's swinging, uh, we'll have more bend loft. You would expect that would mean that therefore you'll have more delivered loft, but golfers are funny. Um, you know, they, they, they you feel think? that that, <laughs> they feel that that shaft, whether they feel it or whether they change the forces that they're applying, or there's some interaction where some golfers decide, Hey, this shaft is bending more. I'm adding loft. I'm not going to do anything. And those are the easy ones to fit. And Hey, there you go. Uh, I've gone to a, a weaker shaft more lead deflection, more delivered loft, ball goes higher with a bit more spin. Great. That's easy. Stiffer shaft goes the other way. Mm -hmm. But then you get some other golfers who say, you know what? I'm going to completely compensate for the fact that this shaft has more bend loft and I'm actually going to lean my hands more forward. So in the shaft study that, that I did, um, I think it was published in 2017 comparing stiff, you know, stiff shafts to flexible shafts. Um, there was Across the group of golfers, there was very little difference in delivered loft, but there was a full two degrees different in bend loft. So the loft that was being added due to shaft deflection was mm -hmm. two degrees, but there were so many golfers that just added a bit of shaft lean at impact that it kind of wiped out the fact that of the added loft due to the shaft deflection. You lean your hands more, that tends to de-loft it. So all on average, the balls were kind of launching the same, um, which gets to your point where we were talking offline, where it, it is still, you can get to a ballpark, you know, my, this is my opinion. If you're like, Hey, what shaft should I use? You could measure the person's swing. You could have some kind of, you know, gear system. You could put a device on the, sh on the shaft with their gamer driver and go, okay, I can get into a ballpark here probably with what shaft is going, you're going to best fit into. Um, but the, the golfer can decide, they're not decide, but they can completely put a wrench into that and, and respond very differently to that new shaft in a way that you, you wouldn't expect. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I know that, that with, with, with the identification of, you know, I know you're very familiar with the atoms and the roll system of, of the pivots, and, and and you're obviously very well versed in the ground reaction forces. And you know, if somebody's going to be have more vertical, they're just prone to be a more put more vertical force in the ground. That shaft's going to stand up more, and there's going to be that more of that lead deflection. And that usually, is, from what I've seen or what I remember, you also couple that with somebody who has a either more or less wrist hinge. We'll, we'll call it for lack of a better term, meaning take somebody like a, a Steve Stricker who has very, very little uh, wrist hinge or even Jason Day. And then comparatively, you look at somebody like a Sergio Garcia who has a lot of wrist lag, we'll call it, coming into impact. Now, I'm yep. sure somebody out there is going to argue, well, he doesn't have lag. It's just saying, well, the shaft and his lead arm. And, okay. But it's more than but, Stricker. Yes, it's more than Stricker. <laughs> uh, and, and I said many years ago when I had learned a, a lot of this was, you know, Stricker and Jason – and my, myself included, which is why I know that they like the same things. And Colin um, lives here when, when he was caddy and, and, and Jason's coach. Uh, so I, I knew where Jason's clubs were built to is his frequency and, and the profile of shaft. But J Jason, S Steve Stricker, and I hate to lump myself in there, but just for example purposes, I'm not saying I'm at their level. But w w with a limited amount of wrist hinge. Uh, you, you you like that softer feel at impact, and that's why all of us played Project X for many years ago, uh, because as that softer tip, and you, and you like that willowy feel at impact. Where somebody like a Sergio that is coming in with a, a lot of 
that that shaft angled much further, they're going to completely hate that shaft and that shaft's not going to perform right because it doesn't match their swing profile. So, I mean, you've got that, then you've got the, the ground reaction forces. So is someone going to be more vertical? I, I think Gears has a comparison of Lexi Thompson and her brother Curtis on there where Lexi has more vertical. Curtis has more, I think, ro was it rotational or lateral? I can't remember which, but he obviously has more shaft lean. She has more vertical. So the shafts, it, it, it's got that lead deflection. So it's going to kick the ball up. And then, I mean, you even compound that with, with the design of club heads where all the low spin drivers that many of the tour pros use were the, the weight is closer to the face and what, what which will bring the spin down and the launch down and then you have what is deemed the more amateur driver where the the weights further in, in, towards the back of the club and the moi is higher so it's like you take all these things moving variables plus this person swinging as you mentioned their reaction to adjust to the new shaft that you give them it's like it makes it very very difficult and why i think so many people can be right in that certain segment that they're testing yet they can still continue to argue it's like you but all of you are writing your own way it's just how do you make sure that all these things blend to optimize what the golfer's trying to do yeah it, it, you know and i i just keep defaulting to uh the the trial and error process of a of a good fitter um in the end we have the tool to know if that shaft is better for you you know, mm -hmm. if you get on a, a track man, a flight scope, a, a GC quad, even a lot of the, um, you know, like a, a Mevil Plus now is pretty darn good at, at, at giving um, good spin and launch numbers. Um, and you get a fitting tool uh, like Ping has to try and decide, okay, you know, what's your attack angle? What's your speed? You know, this is the window you should be in for for optimizing um, in terms of uh, ball spin and and launch angle. and good a good fitter with some experience um can, can dial you into it to a shaft that that helps and you know i i like to then then i like to play around with you know in my head things like torque you know so if you're like okay well we've got the shaft that's producing good ball flight but if the player says feels sporty you know feels mm -hmm. stiff like you're saying then to me then that's where you can maybe if you have a lot of shafts to to, to play around with you could tweak the torque which will have a minimal effect on the spin and the launch, but can really change the feel. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, and that's, that's something that, um, you know, I take a good fitter with, uh, with a launch monitor over a lot of things for figuring out uh, the best shaft. You know, I, I, I've got a lot of, you know, cool tech in here, but give me a good fitter and a launch monitor. Um, yeah. Bordy is a perfect word to use. I mean, you get a shaft that's got torque in that, 2.4 2.6 range is going to feel feel very very rigid i don't care if it's got a super soft tip or not it's going to feel uh mm -hmm. like it's not moving and then you get one up at 3.8 4.4 4.6 it's going to for the better player and the faster swinger and i know you, you're you've swung at 120 plus it's going to feel like that thing's all over the place at impact mm -hmm. and it's and th that that feeling matters this you know feeling matters sound matters um yeah uh, you know, if, you, if a lot of people will take sound and feel over actual hard, cold performance numbers, especially if they're close. So mm -hmm. that, that matters, you know, um, you, you want a, 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 a driver that that's built to feel really good to you. I think that, that that's it plays key. a large part in the confidence as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. You, know, you could stand up there and you know it. it it feels right and now if you start hitting it crooked maybe you have to have, to have your feels yeah, adjusted yeah. <laughs> sure yeah um let, let's not oh one, one more thing on that. as you because you mentioned balls i mean let, let's th just throw another variable on top of that because obviously marty was on his show came out this week and we were talking about the ball dynamics and i asked him what the genesis of that was and he said it i think it was the eight, 2018 national club pro where he just said that he the 410 just came out and he they're trying to get he his spin rates where he wanted and his window was spot on and they gave him one of tony Finau's balls that was a lower launch but the spin was the same he goes that's amazing he said yeah look down expecting it to be 500 less rpm and it's identical spin but the window was just perfect and so i mean not and and then the ball world has just blown up like everything else it's like i i feel i mean i have access to guys like you and marty and eric and a whole lot of other people and i'm sitting here confused sometimes and I just think about the general consumer sitting home watching golf on the weekend and they're going out there, they go to their local shop or 
whatever they're going to go to or the fitting and they have no clue what, what to do. And just hopefully they get the right person. You know, you know, and that's, uh, there's a lot to unpack there. Marty would do a much better job than me. Um, but you know, some, some of my take homes are that Titleist is just probably a really safe pick for their yes. consistency. <laughs> um, there are a lot of high quality balls that, that, that cost a lot that just, vary so much from year to year like when i first did the ball namic um it was uh i i you know i ball namic fitting and i put this was a few years ago i put in okay I, I want a ball that performs really well in wind and i want high spin around the green there's a few things that i that i picked mm -hmm. and it recommended um uh tp5x and i had um won a few boxes in some playing in some events and so I was, you know, giving them their day in court. Hey, you know, let's, let's, and I was like, God, I just can't stand the, I just could, did not like the way they were performing around the greens. And then the Balnamic had recommended, Hey, this is, you want some high spin around the greens. And I was like, look, Marty, I, cause it was when, when before it was really launched the Balnamic. I'm like, I, I'll be honest. I don't know about this recommendation, but he goes, well, what, what's the year on the box? I'm like, what's the year of, of what he's like, you know, and it's, it's not easy. Yeah. You know, they don't, they don't, they don't advertise it on the front. They, don't they, they just advertise. change the design of the box. Right. Right. And so, oh, uh, so I've, you know, get the box out and I'm looking and it's like in like font two and a half. <laughs> and, and he's like, yeah, well look at how much the performance has changed from this year to this year with that ball. I was like, well, it, it, it it's crazy to me. And I don't know. I'd be curious to know, is it, is it on purpose? They're like, Hey, let's, let's make this change to see a performance difference. And then I guess they got all the marketing out there. So they don't bother changing the, the name, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or, or was it a, oops, the supplier was like, well, mixed a little too much, you know, this with that. And now the, 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 the sirloin covers a little, or whatever the hell, you know, the core's different, the cover's different. I, I don't know. Um, Titleist, you know, uh, uh, on the other hand, um, they seem to have made some some change. When they do change, they seem to be for the better. You know, mm -hmm. like um, the, the AVX model is, is 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 different, but the changes have kind of um, been for the better. You know, uh, so it, it's interesting. I, yeah, it's 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 wild out there. So that the, to me the. <laughs> The crazy thing was that they can change so much from year to year um, and that you can have balls that have the same launch monitor spin launch numbers, but because of the drag on the ball through the air can behave very differently with their trajectory. It, it's um, just amazing. Yeah. And you know what? I think Titleist, well, they screwed me up a couple years ago when they basically flipped. And then they, oh, then they, they, then they said, yeah. And then they said, well, we moved them closer together, but we flipped them. I'm like, okay, now, now I'm really screwed up. Yeah. That was, wasn't that wild? Yes. It was just like, I and, said, why? that's also another one where I wonder, like, did they like get through like 20 million balls and they're like, oh no, <laughs> these weren't the X's? <laughs> Shit. Well, change the paint, change the paint yeah. on the number. Well, no, that's, you know, they're like, yeah, they had, they forgot to swip, uh, switch the, uh, the X to the, or from what, what I understand is that, um, they, they didn't want the, the X was actually starting to be more popular mm -hmm. and they didn't want the most popular ball to be, you know, something that has a subscript right the pro v one's the flagship ball <laughs> right. but actually for the most people they were kind of like oh this x is really good so then they're like oh we'll just make the properties of the x the yeah i but i don't know you'd have to ask somebody a little bit more on the inside and, but that's, and, that was and my as understanding far as names you remember going wait like uh 2000 what, what year was it 2000 or 01 when ernie l shot 30 some under in hawaii and and they well, i'm using the new Titleist Pro V or was it the Pro VX at the time? And then they had to come <laughs> out right. with that name because he gave the name away on national television. Right. Right. <laughs> so yes, yeah. I'm sure things get human error. Something happens in manufacturing and then like, oh shit, we got to go with this. Now we've got X amount of millions of balls produced and the covers on this. So it's going to be different than last year's. And what, and, and that's, that's the, the value. If you're a serious golfer of, of checking out Balnamic, 
you know, I, I mean, I don't have the ability to to do all that research and figure out on my own. And there's enough, you know, uh, what do I go buy? You know, drop 60 bucks to buy a dozen balls to test them out. Um, and then I'm like, nope, this nope. year was bad. Or I could just, you know, kind of shortcut the process and, and check That's, out. Ball I, I've, been, I, I've got on that, you know, having Marty on talking about, it, I've been telling everybody since I said, you got to go on here. I mean, for, for the reasons that you just described is a balls change from one year to the next. And it's you, nobody, unless you're in the space and unless you're Marty or you're somebody who's working with balls all the time, you're a ball rep and, and you know, the differences from year to year and you know, your own game, but how many people out there are like that? So it's like, Hey, everybody, here's this fantastic tool you can use. Use it yep. twice a year. And I was surprised here twice a year or whenever you get refit or to start the year. And it makes total sense, you know, once you understand why. Yeah. And, you know, my golf spies, they're getting pretty darn good with their testing. They've got some really mm -hmm. interesting stuff like that. Maxi fly makes a really good ball. Don't just, you know, that, you know, if you're looking for something that's a, you know, um, for 30 or $35 a dozen. Yep. It's, yep. Yeah, that's a pretty good ball, and you know the the AVX has gotten a, a a lot better as well. If you're if you're looking for something that you know has a has a lower lower trajectory, mm -hmm. um, I want to. I, I can't talk to you without talking about the stack. Um, um, it, it's been a huge success, Absolutely. and rightfully yeah. so. But now I I do have to ask. So Marty, I asked him how the whole thing came about, and he said that you came out there with a basically a shaft with a bunch of washers on the end of it. So I'm not trying to <laughs> yeah. cause it, I'm not trying to cause an inner company argument, but uh, so w w was that how it actually came about, and and you guys worked on it from there? Yeah, essentially. I mean, um, I had tried. I had done some. Uh, over speed overload research with with a few different groups with different things like uh, ping made this really cool driver um that they put a ton of hot melt into it and then they scalloped out with a with like a a, a water jet uh cutter chunks of metal of the head so we had a really light head a really heavy lead so we did some research there and then yeah basically one of the iterations was a shaft with a bunch of washers and stuff made at um you know home depot uh, that i kind of strung together um and yeah, the kind of the hope was, well, you know, I, I understand the, the biomechanics and the training. I'm not great at building golf clubs, you know, so maybe, um, uh, we could do a little partnership with ping ping's not into training aids. It's not their, not their direction. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but Marty was like, Hey, this seems like, you know, the good idea, you know, golfers can get faster. Um, I know how to design clubs. So basically I would provide the you know the specs hey we we needed to have this moment of inertia the center mass needs to vary like this uh the mass needs to vary like this and he designed a pretty sweet looking um stack um and uh we uh got a really talented um app designer um yeah programmer. That, that is it, it's i i told marty i said i'm extremely tech challenged as tech challenged as anybody out there and i said friends have asked me well is it real hard to do i'm like this is the easiest thing that i've ever done on, on my phone and then of course marty being that always looking for ways to improve it says we well, can make it easier you just put the voice command on you don't have to type in the speeds yeah. anymore i'm like oh great make me feel even smaller <laughs> yeah it's really uh super it's so easy there's no thinking and a lot of times the people will ask questions well you know what program should do you recommend or what should i and i'm like should i how often should i do it i'm like just just follow the app, you know, like mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time taking all my decision tree thoughts, you know, and, and programming, programming them in there. Um, so if I looked at all your data and this is how I would originally do it. So when I was, you know, first working with say Fitzpatrick or um, even with, when, when Marty was trying it out, I had, we shared an Excel spreadsheet, mm -hmm. they would do their workout and then I would figure out, okay, this is what your next workout should be like a good trainer in the, in the gym, they right. reevaluate me. Okay. This is what we should be doing next day, but you can, the, the decisions you would make based on the data, you can program that. So hmm. the app can look and say, well, here are the weights you were swinging. These are the speeds you were swinging the night yesterday. This is your, your next workout. Um, and when we do testing, you, you know, uh, we do pre-tests and post-tests baselines and progress checks and that information really drives what the program recommendation is right so here's where you're at as a golfer in terms of speed we would recommend um this program do you struggle swinging 
uh, things that are slightly heavier than your driver? Do you struggle swings that are, struggle swinging things that are slightly lighter than your driver? Um, well, we'll target those with this with this next program. You know, I've actually I use apps a lot um, for, for working out and. Mm -hmm. The stack app is really, it makes it way easier than I find I get frustrated now using other apps and I'm like, why, why isn't, where's, I want the rest timer to just be there and just tell me when to, you know, when to do my next set. I want, I want my brain to shut off and just be able to focus on the, 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 the training. Um, you know, I, I was, that, I had Lee Cox on a couple of weeks ago and I was very surprised because I spent a number of years in, in training, um, started when I hurt my back and then had, when, when the credit fallout happened and there was nothing to do. Um, I had gotten heavily into uh, Charles Poliquin's information and, and his studies and data uh, being up from close to where you are. I don't know if you were familiar with Charles's work, but um, ben, ben Patrick, the knees over toes guys, was one of his disciples mm. uh, and he's they're doing some very good work but but w one of the things that that charles was discussed was as you get into program design w which a lot of the stack reminds me of uh as you mentioned working out and apps not being quite right so for example it, he said if you're because he worked with more olympians and world champions than i think any trainer in, in history so he, he obviously knew his stuff very good but for example if, if they they would find one rep max and then they would base the largely base the workout sure. of that so if you're doing but the, the the thing that I found interesting as far as what Lee said, which struck me as odd, was as you get into the muscle fibers and the types and the fast twitch and, you know, type 2A, two, two B, and C, and, and then it, it you need more neural recovery time than you do muscular recovery time. So when they were training guys for Olympians or world champions, if they're doing uh, three sets, let's say they're ramping up 95%, 98%, 100%, 102 or 101, 103% of one rep max, and they're gearing it back down. They would have up to five minutes of rest time in between sets. So they're mm -hmm. maximizing their output, and then they have to have that time to recover. In the speed training realm, Lee, Lee said his guys, he, they're, they're just hitting one after another. And Now that makes somewhat sense because in the World Long Drive Championships, they're hitting so many balls yeah. in succession. It's a strange sport. It is. Uh, which kind of goes contradictory to the physiology of the human body. But I know that, you know, in the stack, obviously you guys have the wait period in between. And then after a set, you have a uh, two or three minute wait period, which I said, this is, this is spot on. Um, yeah. So as I'm watching it, this and I'm like, this, this is great. Well, and, and yeah, long drives an interesting dis this discussion for sure. Um, what we're able to do, we've got 30,000 users now and we can, well, we're, we're constantly, the app is constantly figuring out what is the, you know, optimal mm -hmm. rest and set times. We can go in there and it's changed over the, the last three years. But we can, an easy way to see, hey, well, maybe we're off because I'll have people say, you know, hey, I didn't get any faster. And that's about 0.5% of the users. And I'll go in and look and they're doing three seconds between swings. I can see this because everybody can see this. If you go into the app right yeah. now, you'll be able to see what your average rep rest is and set rest, and they're resting a minute um, between sets. So about 20% of our users kind of meet a threshold where they're not following the protocol, and they do not get faster as much as the folks that do. So it's, it's, people think, well, no, I'm going to work out every day. Well, that's probably mm -hmm. not optimal. Well, I'm only going to rest for 30 seconds. Well, we've got, you know, 25,000 people over here that are getting a lot faster than these 5,000 who aren't exactly following the protocol. Could be some other reasons, but that's a lot of, a lot of data, um, you know, uh, to, to, to go on. So uh, there's, and there's good rationale for that. Rest is, rest and recovery is really important when you're trying to do, exactly. yeah, high quality, high quality stuff. I think just to get into the long drive, because I've had some some discussions with Josh Koch, Martin Borgmeier around this, and there's not a lot of great science done on the sport. It, it, it's still in its its infancy, um, and it, it it seems like well, this kind of person over here has done it this way, so I'm going to try it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to kind of follow what what they've done. If everybody's kind of doing the same thing you know, in general, then it's tough to know, well, maybe somebody could be swinging 180 miles an hour club head speed. We don't know. No one's really, you know, it's 
right? It, it, but it's kind of like like Fosbury flop or the rotational technique in shot put. You know, those took a long time before someone was like, wait a minute. I think I know a better way to go over this high mm-hmm. jump bar. Um, and if you tried it right away, you probably weren't going to do it. You, you know, it took a little bit, a little bit of practice to, to get it. W- one of the things I find really interesting with long drive is that guys will say, well, I don't hit my peak ball speed until like ball 80. You know, that's mm-hmm. when I, that's when I'll set my PB for the session. You know, if I'm, if I'm going to hit, you know, 240 ball speed, it's, you know, I've already been swinging for an hour. And that, that's very strange to me from looking at a lot of, I have, you know, decent background, a lot of different sports, you know, track and field. We're looking at uh, published papers on Olympic lifting, high jump, baseball pitching, you, you, you name it. No one's peaking at rep 80, you know, yeah, like imagine if you said, weird. all right, we're going to throw for maximum pitching speed. And, uh, you know, what happens at ball 80? after you've thrown pitches for an hour, you're not, you know, you're not re- you're, you're going to hurt probably, something. You're going to hurt something. Right. Um, same with, you know, uh, if you were squatting and you're like, all right, I'm going to squat my most on my 80th rep here or my, I'm going to do, it's going to take me 80 jumps to before I jump my highest. So, you know, what I think is going on is if, if you look at, let's say if I was um, doing a track workout, and we're, we're, the, the goal of the workout is to, to work on top end speed. We'll probably warm up for 45 minutes to an hour. And the workout might take 10 minutes. Yeah. Whereas I think that a lot of these long drive folks are really just extending out their, their workout, their warm up. Do you know what I mean? And Makes so they total sense. Right. Um, maybe it's the best way to do it. Probably not, but that's you know that's kind of the the the, the culture at the moment, and I, and I could be wrong, but that it just seems odd when you when you look around. The, the other thing that they're kind of stuck with is the nature of the event. You know, it's like um, doing these little mini sprint races like ten times uh, throughout the course of a weekend. You know, it's like all right, I'm going to go do like eight max sprints and then I'll get like 20 minutes off and then eight more max sprints or, mm-hmm. you know, it, or so part of me is like, well, maybe the way the reason why they train in at 80 balls is to help them prepare for the structure of the event, you know, but if your goal I think was just to make one swing to set a club head speed or a ball speed record, you would probably warm up and do things differently as opposed to hitting 80 balls in a row to try and get that, um, that PB. Yeah, it, it makes total sense. Again, going back to how the Olympic powerlifters or most of the athletes are training world champions, they're not training in the same way. Who are, who are looking to to do a one lift, clean and jerk, a squat, a dead, whatever they're doing. They're looking for explosive power for what a second, second and a half. Um, yeah, and then like, that's it. In high jump event, might take you know hour and a half, two hours you're doing at most like a lot of jumps would be like 15 would be like, it's a lot Mm -hmm. of jumps, you know, uh, not 80. (laughs) It it would have to be, I think that the change would have to come from those running the event that they're changing the structure of the event that would allow for, if someone got with them and said, look, the the way that you're structured, the event is not allowing, I mean, it's allowing obviously for prodigious distance and things that the average human can't even, they just jaw drop. But if you want to maximize and find out the, have these players hit the ball even longer i think if you modified it to this to allow them rest and recovery in between more so than 20 minutes or eight balls or whatever it is within was it three or three minutes i i don't even remember um we think that you can make it more dynamic it, it could be better for the players that they're not going to hurt themselves and it could be better for the fans and that they're going to increase the distance by x amount because they have more rest time it's a good question. The balancing of the entertainment value uh, versus the the, the performance. Um, certainly, if if someone came to me and said, "Well, I'm going to try to set the world, lo- you know, the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest drive or the highest ball speed," I probably wouldn't choose to train them the way folks are training now for long drive. Yeah, makes sense. It, it, some as far as uh, well, I got to ask you this: as someone who just turned 51, and as we talked before the show, it, it's hard to follow the protocol. With, with you know three days a week or two days because it just don't recover as fast as I used to when I was 25 is 
and I know that you guys obviously three years have tons of data through, through the system and you got to pick and choose given what you have to do with, with your teaching job and everything else. But has there been any consideration to, to, as far as going forward, Hey, we have X amount of people in this age range that as we look at this, they're, they're their training is more spaced out. So maybe we adjust uh, for age appropriate. Yeah. It, it, it's a great question, Pete. Um, we've built in a lot of flexibility. Um, it, it, it's, 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 I've got a lot to say about this. It's tough to tell someone exactly when to work out from a distance or in an app without knowing everything in their life. Mm -hmm. um, even, you know, I've been following, uh, you know, the whoop data, the aura data, the, the, the tracking someone's heart rate variability and someone's, you know, sleep patterns, all that information to try and predict when and how hard they should work out. Um, and, you know, and the big, the best predictor of when they should work out is how are you feeling? You yep. know, you, you can't. I just, I don't, I don't have a lot of faith in that data, looking at the research that's been published and looking at elite athletes that are, are trying to go off, whether it's an Apple watch or whatever, saying, no, no, things are, things are low right now. And the, the mo for the most part, most people have a predisposition to, there seems to be this extreme. A lot of people are like, oh, I'm a bit tired. I'm not going to work out when really they probably should be working out. And then there's a very small fraction of people that would work out to the point where they would, you know, uh, wear the skin off their hands. And even if they've, you know, had the flu and were dying Guilty. in bed, they'll work. Yeah, okay. Guilty as charged. And, and it, there's very few people in the middle that would, you know, kind of, you know, just um, kind of have a good sense of that. There are some, obviously. Um, so <laughs> what we do with the app is we give you a workout window where the, the 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 least amount of rest you should ever do it's like 42 hours so you get some weird times in the app you know mm -hmm. we're trying to you know kind of optimize that um but basically if you if you do a stack session on monday we don't want you doing another stack session until wednesday right you we, we want want you to take tuesday off but the the workout window allows you to to go all the way into you know friday morning potentially without really impacting things Ideally, it would be either Wednesday or Thursday, but you could go into, you know, Friday morning. Um, and it, it's up to the person to figure out with all the other stuff they've got going on in their life. Did you not sleep well? Did you eat poorly? Yeah, Are I you thought that was a, a great, great uh, that you guys have that questionnaire to, to have better understanding of the lifestyle that the person is going through. Right. After each workout you put in, what was your health? What was your energy? So we're, you know, we can use, we can use that data. And it, it <laughs> If we don't know, even if someone put in their workout data, hey, I did, uh, I went for a uh, 30 minute run. It's really tough to know, well, how hard was that 30 minute run on your body? You know, like if you hadn't run in a while and you did a 30 minute run and you, you know, ran 10 kilometers, that was pretty, use, that was a pretty intense run. Mm -hmm. You know, you're probably not going to be ready to do a stack workout the next day. Um, or somebody might put in exactly how much weight they lifted with squat. Maybe we can take that information. And I know every rep and set, but I don't know how hard that was in their body, right? It, it's much easier for, for us to give guidelines and, and say, look, um, if, if you don't feel quite ready to do that workout on Wednesday, if you're, you, you know, you feel like I haven't recovered, then wait till Thursday. Um, we give guidelines around, uh, I like having days that are mostly completely off throughout the week mm -hmm. where you, you maybe you do some really light, some stretching or something like that. But I'm not a fan of if I had, you know, if, let's say if I was stacking and lifting weights, which I do, I'd like to have those on the same day, do my stack session, go lift some weights. And maybe the next day I'm, you know, I'm playing golf or I'm going for a light jog or doing some stretching or some running or hitting balls. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, as opposed to stack one day, then weights, then stack. Things like CrossFit, you got to be really careful about, right? Because they can be yes. really tough to, to, to recover from. Um, or going on really long, I, you know, if you're training for a marathon, you know, you don't train for a marathon and then say, okay, an hour from now, I'm going to do my stack workout. So 
we we try to give people the information, educate them through the FAQ on our website, and then allow them to figure out, you know, when they should when they should work out. Um, do, do you think that any injury that that people have had has been become mostly because of user error, either trying to push too hard or instead of swinging with driver intent, they try to max out too soon. I, I know that it, when, when I've had to take time off, it's because I've been pushing too hard. And again, one, yep. 50 plus, you can only push so hard for so long. And then it's like, okay, the body says you're not pushing anything for a couple of days. Yeah. So yeah. have you have you found that or have they got nothing feedback? Yeah, personal as well. Um, so we <laughs> yeah, put, put a lot of care into the loads that go into the body. So it, it's it, it's not about what percent heavier is the stack than your driver or lighter. That that's not that doesn't really tell you much. What what I measure in this lab and have you know had hundreds of people through all different swing types, all different ages from juniors up to people who are 80, I know what the loads are on the body when they swing their driver. And what we're trying to do is just go at speeds that are slightly faster and loads that are slightly heavier, okay? Mm -hmm. um, you, you need to have a, a, a stimulus over what's typical to have the body adapt. Yeah. And, and so we, we've, and, and there are safeguards built in. So if we know you're swinging your, the 195 gram at 100 miles an hour, the app knows what weights to choose for your heavier sets, for your overload sets. And if it's, it could be off by 10 grams, which isn't a lot. And if you swing that, you, you, let's say it recommends swinging the 240. You swing the 240, it knows how fast you swung the 195. And it goes, huh, we were expecting the 240. Let's say you swung the 195 at 100. Huh, we were expecting the 240 to be at 96. It was at 94 miles an hour. That's too slow. The, the next workout, it won't recommend 240. It'll recommend 220. Makes total sense. So, Right. And so, and same thing on the, on the lighter end. Um, so we're not, it's in my opinion, a bit dangerous to just say, Hey, we're swinging something that's 20% heavier, 20% lighter. Well, what are the loads on the body? And, and also if you, if you look at what are the stresses in the body, if you hit 40 pitching wedges. So we know that like, we're very confident. I'm very confident that Overuse injuries are way more prevalent from playing regular golf and, and practicing than from stacking. Impacting the ground, which you do in most golf shots, or even impacting off-center hits on a golf driver are reducing very high forces throughout the system. Those high repetitive forces, shot shot, taking divots, hitting the golf ball mm -hmm. off-center, those are more injury-inducing than gradually slowing down a club over the period of your follow through. It, it just, it just makes sense. Um, also, if you look at the, the frequency of injuries now, some other safeguards we built in that users may not follow here. Are the, if, if you are feeling that, um, that, okay, you know what? Um, the stimulus is a bit much. Well, for, first thing I would do is I would, instead of going from like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, just say I'm going to do two workouts. I'm going to go Monday, Thursday. Okay, two workouts a week or Tuesday, Saturday or, you know, whatever. Spread, spread, yeah, spread out as equal spread as you can. Spread them out. The other thing is pay attention to the intents in the app. So if you go to do the foundation program, uh, odds are it's your first program. You don't have any max intent swings until the fourth session. Mm -hmm. And that's, and it's only one set. One set of four, of, right? So it's, one it's, set of it's four. Low. It's low. So the rest of the swings are at the fastest level you would swing the driver with on the course. So that, that effort level is, is also modulating the load on your body big time. Okay. Now, I'm guilty this fall of, um, okay, you know, I was feeling pretty good. So I was like, all right, session five, session six. I'm like... Let's go. I've been golfing all summer. Let's go f full out. And yeah, I was like, you know what? This is, I'm now, I had to go from Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I had to go to Monday, Thursday. Be 
I wasn't getting injured, but I wasn't recovering. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> just because I was golfing all summer, I ignored my own advice. I'm the app. And I said, I'm ready to go to the jam up to uh, max intent for every swing. And I was, I, I could show you on my app, speed started to slide. <laughs> you know, I, with the 195, I started out uh, about a month ago, 103, then 104. And I was chipping my way up. And then I had three or four sessions in a row where I lost speed. Um, and, and I'm aware that I was just kind of overdoing it a little bit. There's enough stimulus with the changing of the speeds and the changing of the loads in the body with the overload to progress you along. And it's not about how fast can I get in a month, right? My goal right now is, can I get back to where I was in April, you know, last year by April this year, and I'm gradually going to get going to get there. Um, so, you know, I fell into that trap. The, the other things I I've learned this lesson enough is I'm sweating before I start my stack session. So my stack sessions, I'm doing the foundation again right now. You know, they take 15, maybe 20 minutes at most, mm -hmm. 15, 16 minutes, but I'm warming up for 20 minutes. Yes. You know, from the time that I came into the lab here and I start, I go through all the stuff in the app um, and it takes me um, uh, probably 15 swings at, at full intent after a 15 minute warm up before I'm ready to go. You know, we've got that certify your warm up feature. Um, so those are the things that, that, that you can play with. Right. You go, OK, I want a little bit more time, make sure I'm a little bit more warmed up. Um, it, it, but the, the facts are that the, the, the odds on injury are much lower than if you went out and started, you know, hitting a bucket of golf balls a day. It makes sense. I, I think and I don't know if you guys plan for this or if you knew it going in with, with you, you seem to have that knack of knowing what's going to happen based off the scientific data of what, that you compiled of something uh, that you work with. Uh, but the, the benefit that people are, their, their swings are improving without practicing per se, you know, instead of spending an hour and a half or two hours at the range, they're using the stack two, three times a week and their swings are improving. I, I would have to say that that's, uh, you, you're not going to move that type of weight at that speed and do it efficiently. Uh, in other words, yeah. you have to be efficient in your swing to be able to move faster and faster in, in that, with that stimulus that's, trying to move you to another level that adaptation yes. so it, it's what would did, did you have a very good idea that that was going to happen pre-launch yes yeah, or is that a sure you um if you give someone feedback um with the the speed device um motivation you know the app cheers you know when you set a new record yeah that's pretty cool um, yeah the, it's not surprising that folks will self-organize you know they've already got some idea of what a you know if you're a complete beginner, you're probably not using the stack, right? You're, you're mm -hmm. a serious golfer who's willing to put a little bit of time in to get better. Um, so you have some idea of what a golf swing is like and some idea of what you'd like it to look like. And so with that little bit of knowledge and the motivation to try and beat that speed number, you can self-organize into a better swing. Faster swings are usually better swings. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, even if, if you find that you've been working on something in your driver swing, like, oh, I come over the top, you know, and maybe you do find that with that little over the top move yet, you're swinging the, the stack at 105. And if you kind of like a little more patience in transition, come from the inside, it drops down to 103 or 104. My suggestion is that, hey, don't work on that over the top move sacrifice one or two miles an hour in the training, but groove that, that, that swing that's producing more favorable mechanics for the ball flight you're looking for. You know, um, it, it's, it, it, it's okay to not absolutely max out that top number. If your mechanics are, if you're worried about your mechanics negatively being impacted, you yeah, know, you, 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 if you get the mechanics, right, you can go, that, that will eventually, once you become comfortable with that and, and the, the sequencing of that, you, you, you will pick up that any loss. Speed exactly. You probably gain a mile or two with, with better. Mechanics. Yes. Yes. Um, before I, I let you go, I, I got, because you got the, the putting portion of, of the app is, is yeah. now become more popular. Can you t touch on that? Some, I, I, I will self admittedly, I mean, I'm an affiliate and I haven't used it yet. And I, I guilty as charged, but I, I will be using it very soon, probably as soon as we're done. But, uh, if you would just, just talk about that. So people can check that out as well. Yeah. The, 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 the putting is awesome. You know, um, 
basically Marty and I are both uh, really serious golfers. We, 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 we like to, neither of us like to waste time and we like to do things that are going to make us better at golf. Marty's, you know, admittedly a lot better than I am, but we both are trying to um, play better golf or at least maintain. And the stack putting was really developed out of that. You know, what's the most efficient way to improve your putting and also track things that matter, things that you, that, that, you know, you can learn if you have a missed tendency. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's three modes. First mode is, is to me, it's, it's the best. You need access to uh, a green that has at least a 30 foot putt and a bit of slope. Um, It's called the premier mode. We give you 18 holes. The app will say, Hey, uh, hole one, eight feet downhill, left to right. So you go find that you hit the putt really easy, easy interface. I keep my phone in my pocket and just use my earbuds. Mm -hmm. So you can just, we got these simple voice commands. You just say made app cheers, or you can say, (laughs) Hey, did you misread it? You'll just say misread. Um, and then the app knows, Hey, what types of putts you're struggling with, how you struggle with them. You tend to leave uphill putt short. You tend to, you know, have left to right putts. You tend to misread them high, whatever it is. There's incredible insights. We've also got, we thought this was really lacking out there in the industry was people love to tinker with their short game. Well, let me try this putter. I wonder if I try more so than any other part of the game. What if I try left hand low? What if I try Mm -hmm. the claw? What if I try the belly putter? What if I use an alignment line on my ball? Um, What if I change my pre-shot routine? So we have the ability to uh, punch in these little tags before you start your session. So, hey, this is the putter I'm using. This is the grip I'm using whatever it is. And if you're trying to figure out, well, should I go to the mallet putter or stick with my trusty blade? Alternate sessions. They take about 15 minutes to do this, the stack premier session. Try one with the blade, one with the mallet. Try, you know, session with the line on the ball, not a line on the ball. And we've got this really cool button you can tap that goes statistical analysis and it <laughs> runs, it compares all of the trials, all the sessions you did with, and it'll just give you an answer. And it will tell you even stuff like, well, you know, you sink more putts with the the mallet, but you do have a slight, you know, left bias with it. So that's something to be aware of. Um, Then we've got folks when we're in beta, we're like, I want to use this on the course. This has become very popular with uh, tour players and their caddies. So the caddies can have the on course operating. Um, The player doesn't even know what's going on. They're just, you know, they're um, playing the round of golf, but the caddy can enter it in the app after the round or during the round. It's also great for serious golfers. Um, instead of the app telling you what putt to go and find, you land, ball lands in the green, you walk up and you go, okay, first putt's 32 feet, you know, downhill left to right. Hmm. And then you hit the putt and you go, oh, I misread it. And this was the error. And this is how long my second putt was. It takes a few seconds to enter it. Hole two, this was my first putt. So it's um, in real so you, time. You, you, you can track your round uh, uh, in, in yeah. the actual environment. Yeah. Or after, you know, you can take some shorthand notes on the, your scorecard and go in after the fact and enter it, um, you know, in, in the app after the round. And then the, the last mode, which, which most of the innovation has gone into, the last mode is called, um, we call Creative Combines. And it has really been awesome for anybody who, like me, is stuck in Canada or where the, you know, you can't get out and putt in the wind. <laughs> You know, Can't as the seasons the change. <laughs> yeah. But you can create your own practice session and it's really uh, unlimited. Um, so you can, you know, like I've got a little indoor putting green here that's got some slope. And I've created a bunch of different combines. Um, and I've right uh, with um, you can get like the dry erase markers for um, blackboards, like mm-hmm. like whiteboards, but are dark do you know what i mean so they're kind of bright colors and i just wrote a bunch of numbers on the green one two three four in different spots um and i created a little combine where you can when you create it up you can make the sessions more or less block practice so there's one that i'm doing now i've got four holes um and i hit uh two putts in a row to each hole so two putts to hole one two putts to hole two and once you set up the, I put the phone in my pocket, ear pods in, and it goes, you know, hole one, six feet. And we use a clock face 
position to describe it. So it'll be like hole one, six feet, three o'clock. So I go find the one on the green and there's only one, I've got, you know, six holes cut on the green, but there's only one that matches that description. Hole one, six feet, you know, three o'clock, hit the putt, tell it what happened, you know, missed left, misread, whatever was probably Mm -hmm. made. And then (laughs) it'll go, all right, hole one, attempt two. And then it'll say hole two, 12 feet, four o'clock. And I'll go find the hole two. And, and it takes me seven minutes to hit, um, 24 putts. Wow. And, and I, and it, then it tracks for me, my progress. Like, am I getting better? Am I developing a missed tendency? But it's like, so I'll come into the lab, you know, after class or I'm doing something like, Hey, I get seven minutes and I have this really efficient, um, practice. Session. It's so easy to do. Boom, flip up my phone, bang. I get some quality, um, putting in. I w- I always can see if I can, you know, do better than I did last time. And then, you know, I'll mix it up. I'll create it. I've got a few different combines. I've got a yellow, um, you know, dry erase marker with mm-hmm. different numbers. And so I'll, I'll know, okay, I'm going to do that combine. Um, but you could make it fully block. If even if you just have a, uh, a putting mat that's straight, you can go, okay, I'm going to do from three feet, six feet, eight feet. You can vary them. It's, it's it, that's a different mode that's just super awesome so so yeah. n- no one has the excuse that i don't have time to work on my game anymore if you don't have seven to ten minutes to, to work on your putting game which arguably is a low-hanging fruit i mean i even yeah. lou even lou stagner admitted that when he came i said yeah uh short yeah. putts are the low-hanging fruit to improve your score that, that you don't have an excuse anymore so yeah and anyone out there that says well i have this and i have, I have work i have kids i have family yeah a, a lot of people do but you do have seven to ten minutes even if it's before you go to bed that you can yeah. practice. So, you, but you got to get the stack to do it. <laughs> Let me. Uh, I'll make sure uh, to get you uh, a, a link for your users to have a three month uh, free trial. Oh, that'd be amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Remind that. me of that. Make sure. I know we'll you got to run. Um, but were you, you talking anywhere? I know you're always talking somewhere. You got talking anywhere? Is this off? You know, coming in the holidays, you're going to be stuck up there in Canada. Uh, you're not getting down do anywhere it, warm. Doing a bit of traveling. So I made, made a few jaunts to Florida to work with a couple of players already. I went to Andrew Rice's coach camp, um, talked about the shaft spining, talked about uh, putter shaft stiffness, did a neat study on putter shaft stiffness that I presented there. Um, did a lot of, uh, another one on blade length. Uh, we could have a whole other podcast. We will. Um, and I, I've got some okay. interesting stuff. I'll email it to you on head weight of putters versus where the, where the, the uh, how much tipping should be done, depending on what cool. the player wants to feel. I'll, I'll email you those. Uh, check those out and play with it. And if you've got any questions, call me. Sasha, cool. it's always a pleasure. I, I've overstepped my time frame as usual uh, with most guests right. and you as well. But uh, I, I really appreciate it. I think everyone's going to take something from this as well. And everybody, be sure. Again, I'll have a link to the stack in there. We'll have Sasha's promo in there. And um, be sure to get it. It is the easiest way to improve your game. Two times a week. What do you say? 15 to 20 swinging and 15 to 20 so basically a half hour and yeah. seven to ten minutes on your putting and you'll be taking all your friends money that's right <laughs> awesome i appreciate it thank you very much thank you pete